Okay, so this talk is going to be potentially very complicated, and it's going to go fairly fast. Um, I'm on a mission to humanize quantum computing. I think it is something that will change the world uh, in many, many ways. We'll talk about later at the end of the presentation. Uh, but this is what I want you to understand. I want you to kind of get an idea of what it is, who's been working with it, where did it come from, how does it work, all of that. And we're going to try to cram that into the next 14 minutes and 44 seconds. It's only 95 slides. It'll be fine. So, first thing you hear about quantum computing is the bits are dead. Uh, everybody wants to pretend that it replaces classical computing, that it changes the world forever. I think it will do those things, but I want you to think of quantum computers more as a GPU or a cloud processor or a coprocessor. And the one thing I want you to remember about quantum computing is this coin, the two euros I stole from my new best friend that mic'd me up. Um, think about classical computing, heads or tails on a flat surface. So that is to say that if it's heads, it's a one. If it's tails, it's a zero. And that's how you can think of classical architecture. Think of quantum computing, like the coin flipping in the air. So it's in a constant state of a one or a zero or maybe both. And we don't know what it is until we stop it in our hand, right? So take that one thing away if you take nothing else. So who's interested in this? Where's the big stuff going on? Well, in 2015, this is what investment around the world looked like. As you can see, there's a ton of countries. The United States was third on investment. They were actually second on patents. Uh, I'm first on patents, but the United States has fallen behind. Uh, Canada is a leader. Uh, Japan is a leader. China just created a $10 billion, 92 hectare acre facility for quantum information science. So it's a very important. But what I want you to pay attention to next is the influx that happens around 2014 in the patents, both in general publications and then by qubits, hardware, applications. In 2014, 2015, you saw an uptick in the investment, in the number of startups, in the patents, in the material science advantages, everything. So while quantum computing has been around for a long time, the concept was created in 1982, I think that we are on the precipice of it actually becoming something real. Um, a lot of countries talk about national security. I don't think you can have a lot of national security when every single researcher is working with multiple researchers from other countries. Uh, I think that makes it very hard. I think this should be an uh, open source technology. I think it should be a world-based technology, uh, democratized as uh, many things that affect our lives should be. Uh, there's a ton of universities working on this everywhere. Uh, Waterloo University is one of the, the best. Delft, just uh, two days ago, announced that they had made a breakthrough in quantum entanglement. Of course, all of your Yales and Berkeleys and Caltechs. And where I'm from in Austin, Texas A&M and UT actually have two quantum computing classes that they're teaching now. Uh, MIT offers one online, but these are actual courseware in the classroom. So Google, Microsoft, Intel, IBM are all doing things. The company you might not know is D-Wave. They make an adiabatic quantum computing and annealer. Um, they're based in Canada. Uh, startups to watch, uh, Icon, IonQ is doing ion trapping as a technology. Uh, OneCubit is a software company, QCWare software. Control-C software, Rigetti also makes hardware. Uh, they're making a uh, quantum machine that works on circuit gate models, much like the IBM machine. Uh, but the third thing I want you to remember is that this, I think, is the space race of this generation. Um, everybody is very big on AI. I'm not an AI hater. I don't think killer robots will get us. And if uh, there are killer robots, I will just wait for the shitty battery technology to make it die, and then I'll tear it apart and make it into something new. Because uh, uh, Boston Dynamics runs on diesel for a reason. But this is very important. There's more money being invested. There's more at risk with encryption threats, with the potential to cure diseases, to do things. It's an incredibly important area. So when did it all start? It's a quick history of quantum, and it's going to be really quick. So go back to the 1830s with Babbage. Skip forward to 26 when Schrodinger derived his wave. 1927, first date I want you to remember. The first Solvoy conference. Schrodinger, Heisenberg, and Einstein all getting together talking about quantum theory. From there, there was Schrodinger's cat, a bunch of other advances with Church and Turing. We go all the way to 1982, past the kneeling, past Shor's algorithm, and then where we end up with is we end up with Oxford's demos, Nishimori, and then Los Alamos. Los Alamos created seven qubits in the year 2000. By 2006, they had achieved 12. D-Wave, which is a different technology, has 128 qubit machines. It's a very important asterisk on there. By 2013, 512. By 2015, 1152. They now have 2048. But here's the important part. In, in uh, last year, 
uh, Rigetti achieved 19 qubits, IBM achieved 17 at the first of the year, and at the end of the year, they achieved 50 qubits. Google started this year with 72. Microsoft released an entire programming language for quantum computing. So this is obviously something that is coming. Intel had 17, everybody's making a lot of advances. But I want you to think about how a computer works so we can go back to that coin and the difference in these compute systems. We have circuits and modules and gates and transistors. And in the old days, you used to have to be an electrical engineer to program a computer because you had to understand the voltage between the gates. Then you just had to understand the gates, and then nowadays there's software engineers who don't even know there's gates. Right now, you have to be a physicist to program a quantum computer, for the most part. Um, I want to take it to where you just have to know the gates, and then eventually there's an abstraction layer where maybe you can just use it for whatever you're doing. Um, the basis of computing, of course, ones and zeros. If we block a signal, it's a zero. If we let it through, it's a one. Computers are still just giant abacuses. Uh, but they're getting very small. The phones that you have, if they have the Snapdragon processor at 10 nanometers. So that means they have 3 billion transistors in them. And so they're getting so small that some scientists worry that as we get to 7 nanometers, 5 nanometers, 3 nanometers, quantum mechanics will come into effect. We won't be able to block signals. So to give you an idea of a nanometer, the idea I like is if a diameter of a marble was a nanometer, then the Earth would only be one meter. Okay, So it's very, very small. I don't think it's a quantum apocalypse. Uh, but I do think quantum tunneling, which is what we just talked about, is important. That means that things are so small that we may try to block a signal, and it may just come through anyway. And if that happens, computing as we know it would break down. So what exactly is a quantum computer? Well, it's a block sphere. So it's electron, it's the spin. There's multiple different ways that you can create a quantum computer, but it's basically using quantum mechanics as the basis versus classical uh, bits, ones, and zeros. Um, there's some theory I want you to remember. Uh, the state of multiple bits is defined by the state of all the bits in an individual system. But in the quantum theory, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. We get an exponential increase, potentially, in the compute power as we add qubits. It's not the same as adding a two-bit system and we add two bits. We have two bits and we add one qubit and we get more and more and more compute power because of the multidimensionality of those states. So we have classical theory, everything can be copied. In quantum, only the results can be copied. So we can't take data and move it in that system. We have to be focused on uh, only the results. So it's Schrodinger's cat. We open the box. We know if the cat is dead or alive. Well, with the quantum system, we look at the result, and then we know where we're at. Uh, there's three types of quantum computers for you to think about. Annealers, circuit gate models, and topological computing, which, as it says up there, is some real black magic shit. Uh, but the annealers are uh, basically like metallurgy. They use a magnetic field to slowly, adiabatically keep the solid state. The circuit gate models work a little bit more like what you're used to in the way classical computer systems work. Uh, and the topological is an area of research Microsoft is the only one working on. And I actually think they have a good chance at getting way ahead of everybody, because in a qubit, where we have a data, the big problem with quantum computing is the noise, the fidelity of the system. And so as we add qubits, the noise comes up and we lose them. So you'll see that Rigetti had 19 qubits, then they had eight. You know, maybe the machine has 50, but 46, you know, things kind of drop. The noise in the system is an incredible problem. With topological quantum computers, we have a topological qubit that can have multiple copies of the data, meaning that the fidelity of the system, in theory, should be very, very high. Um, quantum superposition, you know, quantum tunneling, one thing to think about. Quantum superposition, we've talked about something else to, to know. Quantum entanglement is interesting. It basically means that when we measure a bit, even over a long distance, uh, we cannot measure the other bits without them being the same. They're entangled. Um, there's been a lot of advancements in communications in this area, which are very exciting. So new encrypted networks, a new internet, if you will, that is very, very encrypted. Um, China launched a satellite last year uh, and did the first real uh, communication. So it's a very exciting part of this. Um, if you look inside a quantum computer, they all look like a big chamber, and inside, they look like a giant chandelier. But here's what I want you to pay attention to. Only at the bottom, very bottom, is the real quantum computer. The rest of that mechanism is all for cooling these particles down to 5 millikelvin, negative 15 millikelvin, colder than the reaches of space. Um, and then at the bottom is just the chip. So 
a lot of people talk about quantum supremacy. I understand the term, but I'm not a big fan of it because it gives the impression to people who aren't in the industry that the quantum computer will somehow replace a classical computer. Uh, we need the classical computer to control all of the data in and out, to control the cryogenics, to basically do everything in the system. Uh, we take it from the qu classical computer, send it in, and then we send it back again. So let's look at a calculation. Um, how many people know a Fourier transform? It's an easy way to pick all the physicists and mathematicians out in the audience. None of you can ask a question. That's a joke. Um, so if you think about it, what would that be good for? Well, perhaps breaking encryption, right? Perhaps breaking the RSA. And if you look at Shor's algorithm, the thing that people don't understand often is that four of the five steps you need to run Shor's algorithm have fast classical solvers. There would be no advantage, no quantum advantage in any of the steps except for one. And so that step is, you know, we're going to make sure it's an odd number, we're going to check it's a factor two primes, we're going to check the random number, and then when we get to this step, the order finding, this is where the non-deterministic quantum magic comes in. This is what the quantum computer can be used for as far as applying to breaking encryption. If we factor a number, which they did at the uh, University of Arizona uh, and several other universities now, 15, 15 is not an even number. Uh, it's a product of two co-prime numbers. I picked seven. This is not a factor of 15. Then, you know, number theory, you guys figure that out on your own. And then we get to the answer, and the short story is, you know, 15 is three times five. Uh, but the order finding in Shor's algorithm is really important. That's why I want to stress that I think this is a cloud processor, it's a coprocessor. Um, I don't think a quantum computer is something you run everything on, uh, especially in the near-term future, because to do that, we would need millions and millions and millions of qubits. Uh, but I think it's something that could be used very advantageously now. And I give you a couple of examples. Um, if you're familiar with the traveling salesperson example, you have a computer that does 10 to the ninth operations per second. You want to send them to 14 cities. It takes that computer about 1,000 seconds, right? If you have to go to 22 cities, it takes about 1,600 years. Uh, if you want to go to 28 cities, it takes longer than the time of the known universe. Uh, another great example is Bob Suter uh, you know, likes the caffeine example. Uh, there's 95 electrons in a caffeine molecule, um, and you could basically go to uh, great extents in modeling it, but when you go uh, and you think of the memory size you would need in a classical compute architecture, it is astronomically huge and impossible, but you could do those same modelings in a quantum computer with 160 qubits. Now remember, earlier I said we're at 72 qubits already, the rumor is we'll be 150, maybe 200 by the end of the year. Granted, we get past that fidelity problem. So what could you use it for? Traffic, you know, a big issue. Obviously, cancers and diseases. We're not finding cures. Um, global warming, a big one. Most, client, most climate studies uh, don't end up being super accurate. And the reason is that uh, you're using a classical system to m basically model a quantum mechanical world. And since nature is quantum mechanical, I think one of the things that can come out of quantum computing is that it can be used to make better climate models that are more accurate, that give better data, that give a better stance to convince a lot of the, the people of just what the effects are and how bad they are in a very realistic fashion, instead of kind of the approximate guesswork that we do today. So we want to solve all these problems, but we don't have the compute power. Quantum computing will help take us to that compute power. Um, I think you'll have 1,000 qubits in, say, three to five years, and I think the trip from 1,000 to 100,000 is relatively short, and once you get to 100,000, I think then you can start looking at millions of qubits. Now, do I think we'll have millions of qubits in five years? No. I have no idea when that will happen, but what's very interesting is as the technology advances, we can use the technology itself to solve some of the problems, to do some of the material sciences modeling and thing. So it accelerates it even further, like that curve I showed you earlier. So it's a very exciting area. I want to tell you in my last minute and 30 seconds how you can get involved with this. I would encourage everyone to get involved. Microsoft has a Q Sharp you can go check out if you're a developer. IBM uh, has a uh, program as well in the Blue Mix. Uh, there's some open source tools from one qubit, and IBM uh, and Rigetti has an open source called Forest, a very good tool. Uh, and then my company teamed up with Stack Overflow. How many of you use Stack Overflow? Uh, hopefully, yes. So if you go to quantumcomputing.stackexchange.com, uh, we have an amazing website that we've built with them. There are about 2,700 people that participate in the site. Um, there's some very famous people that participate in the site, as well as physicists and security experts, etc. But we have a 94% answer rate on the questions. 
So there is almost no complex question you can ask about quantum computing that cannot be answered there, usually within you know, the same day or, or next day. Um, so don't be afraid. Do be inspired by this. Uh, we'll publish on Twitter uh, later this afternoon a list of references if you want to do, uh, check that out. And then uh, I have free copies of my first book, the best-selling book on quantum computing ever, Quantum Computing for Babies. It is not a dummies book, though. Uh, for anybody, you know, for whoever asked the best questions, I brought a few free copies. Uh, but it's um, very cool. We had a little bit of a problem with Amazon because people thought it was a dummies book. So the reviews were very harsh. It's made out of cardboard. It's got four words per page. Is this a joke? But it's an actual real resource, and it's an actual uh, resource on quantum computing for you. So thank you very much for your time. With that, we'll see if there's any questions. May I sit here? Yeah, sit down. Thank you, Wooly. You totally raced through that. Fantastic. So you've guessed already there's a few questions and some people are shy to ask oh, them. Good. So yes, there are one. So you can still put your questions in there, but the most pressing one is right now, can we deliver information via quantum entanglement? So that's a big debate. So that's also an area of quantum information science outside of the field of expertise I'm trying to play in. But the general answer is that yes, at some point we'll be able to do that. Now the problem is, is that everybody also thinks that that would be faster than light communication. Uh, but it won't be, because although that's how the physics could potentially work, although Einstein said it was spooky at a distance and it couldn't do that, you actually have to put it through classical systems, which is where you get a slowdown again. Mm -hmm. More questions, because you're going to shoot them at you. Sure. Will classical software engineers have to retrain? So. Uh, I hope not, but if you want to work with it now, then yes. You'll have to work perhaps with some discrete math or some topology, depending on the machine you're using. You definitely have to have some basis in uh, knowledge of physics. And then there's a cute one, because they say it might be banal, but how will quantum computing change how I work, back, shop, navigate? What would, could, might the everyday impact be? It's not banal. That's a great question. I don't know who <laughs> asked that, but definitely we'll get you a book. Um, it, well, first of all, Google is investing very heavily in quantum computing. Why? Well, Grover's search algorithm, right? They would be able to search mass amounts of data. I mean, think about, I have your phone number, but I don't have your name, and I have a phone book. And a computer can find that by going line by line by line by line by line. Whereas with a quantum computer, it could, in theory, only need the square root of the number of entries to get to the same answer. So search will be improved. You won't use it, but you'll see the results of it as a consumer. Other things, AI, uh, obviously, there's a lot of quantum machine learning work going on right now. And in addition to that, uh, things like your autocomplete. Uh, you know, how many of you uh, have texted something you didn't mean to text because of autocomplete, right? Everybody? None of you? Really? I don't believe any of you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so things like that will be all incorporated in the back-end systems where you'll find results faster, you'll find matches faster, you'll improve machine learning, you'll do these things, and those things will all affect you. Perfect. You think seven seconds are enough to explain anything sure, in depth, technically, qubits? So qubits are great. We've got, uh, oh, we got an extra, no, we're going over time. So qubits are very, think of it like a block sphere. And think of it that you have a spin of this particle, and that spin can be affected in your circuit gate, so you can affect it. But annealing qubits and quantum computing circuit gate model qubits and topological qubits are all different types of qubits, and they're not the only ones that exist. So one of the things we're working on, which will be published on quantumcomputing.com later this year, is a standard with the IEEE so that we can help define all of the terms and, and nomenclature involved to make it easier for you to understand. Perfect. So if you want more uh, explanations, quantum computing for babies, is that what they should yes, buy? That, yes. Boom. Well, and if you ask one of those three questions and you come see me on the side of the stage, oh. I will give you a book. Come and get to see Whirly. Big applause for Whirly. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you.